we're delighted that you could join us here this uh, brisk April 16th here in South Bend, Indiana. Um, every semester since the fall of 2001, the Center for Ethics and Culture has sponsored the semi-annual Arthur J. Schmidt Lecture, which brings to Notre Dame distinguished speakers from around the world, including Nobel laureates, outstanding scientists and engineers, leading philosophers, as well as theologians. The lecture series aims to provide occasions at which the Schmidt Fellows, graduate students in the colleges of science and engineering, can join with other members of the Notre Dame community uh, to reflect on the humanistic dimensions of the technological and scientific studies in which they are engaged. As always, we're very grateful to the Arthur J. Schmidt Foundation, whose generosity makes this evening possible. It's a special pleasure for me this evening to introduce my friend and colleague, uh, Professor Adam Schulman, uh, tutor at St. John's College, Annapolis, where among other things he was a um, committee member of my senior oral committee uh, in 1996. So he passed. I did, I passed, at that, which I was very happy about. Um, uh, Professor Schulman has lectured on Sophocles, Xenophon, Aristotle, Francis Bacon, Jane Austen, quantum physics, and the foundations of thermodynamics. His Harvard dissertation was on quantum and Aristotelian physics. He holds a BA in chemistry from the University of Chicago, a BA in physics and philosophy from Oxford University where he was a Rhodes Scholar, a master's and PhD in history of science from Harvard University. He served with me on the staff of the President's Council on Bioethics. He has been a visiting professor at MIT, uh, Harvard University, and is a faculty member of the Hertog Political Studies Program. A 1985 distinguished military graduate of the Army ROTC program at MIT, Dr. Schulman was commissioned as a second lieutenant in military intelligence in the U.S. Army Reserve and discharged from the Army Reserve as a first lieutenant in 1992. We are delighted and honored that he can join us this evening to deliver his lecture entitled, The Discovery of Entropy and Its Significance. Thank you, Carter. My theme is entropy, how it was discovered, what it means, and what might be its wider and deeper implications. I think every educated human being ought to know something about entropy and the second law of thermodynamics, which says that the entropy of the universe or of any isolated part of it is always increasing. After all, aside from Darwin's idea of natural selection, it is the relentless increase of entropy, which is perhaps the discovery of modern science that has most profoundly colored our current view of human life and its status in nature as a whole. Parenthetically, it seems to me that most people find the first law of thermodynamics, which says that energy is always conserved, to be a more or less clear and reasonable principle, with little of the mystery and obscurity surrounding entropy and the second law. That attitude may not be justified, and at the end of this talk, I will suggest that the opposite might be true. So this is a talk about entropy, but in a way it is also about optimism and pessimism in modern thought, as I will show you shortly. The modern scientific notion of energy, or the capacity to do work, was first discovered and championed by Leibniz, the German mathematician and philosopher at the end of the 17th century. He used the Latin expression vis viva, or living force, but since about 1850 we have called it energy, derived from the Greek energeia, a word coined by Aristotle to mean something like activity. Leibniz was the first to propose the conservation of energy as a fundamental law of nature. Around the same time, Leibniz also expressed his view of the ultimate fate of the universe. In 1697, in an essay on the radical origin of things, he wrote, quote, we must recognize a certain perpetual and very free progress of the universe as a whole so that it is always proceeding toward greater culture. And though it may be objected that if this were so, the world should have become a paradise long ago, there is an answer near at hand. Although many substances have already reached great perfection, yet there always remain in the abyss of things parts that are still asleep, yet to be aroused and advanced into something greater and better, and in a word, to a better culture. Thus progress never comes to an end." End of quote. Such was the optimism that could accompany the discovery of energy conservation at the end of the 17th century. Now what Leibniz discovered was more precisely the interconvertibility 
of kinetic energy, or vis viva, the kind of energy that moving bodies possess, and potential energy, the kind that is stored up when a spring is compressed or a weight is elevated above the surface of the Earth. It took another 150 years before modern science recognized that heat is yet a third form of energy, interconvertible under certain circumstances with kinetic and potential energy. The leading figure in that discovery was the English brewer turned physicist James Joule, who, like Leibniz, was a confirmed optimist. Here he is commenting on the cosmic implications of the inclusion of heat in the conservation of energy. Quote, Behold then, the wonderful arrangement of creation, despite the apparent destruction of living force in almost all natural phenomena, we find that no waste or loss of living force has actually occurred. Thus it is that order is maintained in the universe. Nothing is deranged, nothing ever lost, but the entire machinery, complicated as it is, works smoothly and harmoniously." End quote. That is Joule in 1847, perhaps the high watermark of thermodynamic optimism. On April 24, 1865, 10 days after the assassination, assassination of President Lincoln, a new word came into being. That word is entropy. It was the invention of another German scientist named Rudolf Clausius. He fashioned it from the Greek word trope, meaning transformation. As Clausius explained, he wanted to form a word that would be as similar as possible to the word energy, and he borrowed its root from the ancient Greek in the hope that the word would be adopted unchanged in all modern languages. That hope has been abundantly realized. Like energy, entropy is the subject of a fundamental law of nature. But while energy can neither be created nor destroyed, entropy can only increase. As Clausius put it, summing up the two laws, the energy of the universe is constant, the entropy strives toward a maximum. Energy and entropy are the two basic notions of thermodynamics, the science of heat and its transformation into mechanical work. Energy, as I have indicated, may be defined as the capacity to do work. Because of the conservation of energy, it is not possible to do work without expending energy. This rules out the possibility of a perpetual motion machine, that is, a machine that produces more energy than it consumes and thus can run indefinitely without further consumption of energy. Some would say that the intuition, or if you like, the axiom, that no such machine is possible is the logical ground for the first law of thermodynamics. Heat, as we have known since Joule, is also a form of energy, namely thermal energy. But thermal and mechanical energy differ in an important respect. It is always possible to transform mechanical energy into thermal energy, but it is not always possible to transform thermal energy into mechanical energy. For example, a spinning propeller immersed in water will heat the water up by friction, but the heat in the water cannot in general be transformed back into the motion of a propeller. In fact, most heat is not available to do mechanical work at all. The Atlantic Ocean, for example, is a vast reservoir of heat, but very little of that heat can be used to do work. The entropy of a system is, roughly speaking, an indication of how much heat is available to do mechanical work. If the entropy increases, that means there is less available heat. And if, as Clausius stated, the entropy can never decrease, it follows that any heat that has, by an increase of entropy, become unavailable for work is irrecoverable. Applied to the universe as a whole, the law of the increase of entropy has a rather disturbing consequence, which was first noticed in 1852 by the British physicist William Thomson, Lord Kelvin, future Lord Kelvin. Kelvin was the first to spell out the cosmic implications of the emerging science of thermodynamics. Here, in part, is the ominous conclusion of Kelvin's paper. Quote, there is at present in the material world a universal tendency to the dissipation of mechanical energy. Within a finite period of time past, the Earth must have been, and within a finite period of time to come, the Earth must again be unfit for the habitation of man as at present constituted." End of quote. Thus we see, within a few generations, the sunny optimism of Leibniz and the age of reason 
giving way to the doom and gloom of the 19th century, when scientists could prophesy with confidence the ultimate heat death of the universe. It seems to me that this cosmic pessimism, which began to take root in the late 19th century, has since become the dominant mood of the West. I am not, of course, insisting that the discovery of entropy bears primary responsibility for this development, but it must have helped. Here, for example, is Charles Darwin in 1876 commenting on the view now held by most physicists, namely that the sun with all the planets will in time grow too cold for life unless indeed some great body dashes into the sun and thus gives it fresh life. Darwin continues, quote, Believing as I do that man in the distant future will be a far more, more perfect creature than he is now, it is an intolerable thought that he and all other sentient beings are doomed to complete annihilation after such long continued slow progress. Next, here is the British logician and gadfly Bertrand Russell writing in 1903. This is a long quote. Bertrand Russell was inclined to. That man, that man is the product of causes which had no provision, that, that had no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and his beliefs are but the outcome of accidental collocations of atoms, that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve an individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction in the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins. All these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. And finally, closer to home, here is the American theoretical physicist Steven Weinberg in the closing paragraphs of his 1977 book, The First Three Minutes. It is almost irresistible for humans to believe that we have some special relation to the universe, that human life is not just a more or less farcical outcome of a chain of accidents reaching back to the first three minutes, but that we were somehow built in from the beginning. It is very hard to realize that our world is just a tiny part of an overwhelmingly hostile universe. It is even harder to realize that this present universe has evolved from an unspeakably unfamiliar early condition and faces a future extinction of endless cold or intolerable heat. The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it also seems pointless. Weinberger adds some words of, com of comfort. But if there is no solace in the fruits of our research, there is at least some consolation in the research itself. The effort to understand the universe is one of the very few things that lifts human life a little above the level of farce and gives it some of the grace of tragedy. It is partly in this, in this spirit that I offer the following account of the discovery of entropy. By the end of this hour, I hope to have exhibited the difference between merely knowing by hearsay that the entropy of the universe is always increasing and understanding with some precision where that idea came from, what it really means, and what evidence it rests on. The remarkable story of its discovery spans the years 1824 to 1854, during which most of classical thermodynamics was created by three men, one French, one British, and one German. Our story begins in 1824 when a young French engineer named Sadie Carnot wrote a long essay entitled Reflections on the Motive Power of Fire. With this little book was born the science of thermodynamics. That science reached maturity essentially within one generation, thanks largely to the work of Kelvin and Clausius. Thermodynamics is the theory of the relation between heat and work, but its origins lie in practical engineering. The early 19th century was the age of the steam engine. In a steam engine, combustible fuel is burned in a furnace, water is thereby boiled, 
and the pressure of the expanding steam is used to drive a piston. A steam engine is an example of a heat engine, which expends a certain quantity of heat to produce a certain quantity of usable work. Steam is known as the expansive agent or working substance in a steam engine. Other heat engines use other substances, such as air, alcohol, and so forth. Carnot's reflections begins with a series of questions chiefly of interest to engineers. What is the most efficient means of deriving work from heat? Is there any limit to the motive power of fire, that is, of the ability of heat to do work? Could improvements to the steam engine raise without limit the ratio of work produced to fuel expended? Would a heat engine be more efficient, for example, if it worked with an expansive agent other than water vapor, such as air? Or is there an assignable limit to the motive power of fire, a limit which the nature of things will not allow to be passed by any means whatsoever? On these seemingly modest practical foundations, Carnot built the theoretical edifice of classical thermodynamics. At first glance, it might seem that a hot body all by itself can always be used to do work. One simply puts the hot body in contact with an expandable vessel filled with, with a gas, such as air or steam, and uses the pressure of the expanding gas to drive a piston. Voila, work has been done. But Carnot was the first to see, clearly, that to derive work from heat, one, one must have not only a hot body, but also a cold body. To understand his insight, it will be helpful first to say something about the context in which Carnot was thinking and writing about heat engines. At the end of the 18th century, the chief rival to steam power was water power. Consider how a water engine, that is to say a water wheel, derives work from the water flowing down a stream. A water wheel generates motive power by taking in water at a given height and releasing it at a lower height. Work can be derived from water engines only where there is water elevated above the adjacent terrain. As we would say, the potential energy of the elevated water is converted into the mechanical energy of the water wheel. Or as Carnot and his contemporaries would put it, the fall of water is the source of the motive power of the water engine. If all the water on Earth were at sea level, there would be in effect a kind of equilibrium and no work could be done by water engines. Only where there is a lack of equilibrium in the elevation of water, that is, wherever water is raised above some of its surroundings, can work be done when the water falls. In reflecting on the steam engine, Carnot noticed what seemed to him an analogous fall of heat. What happens in a steam engine is this. Heat is generated at the furnace at a high temperature. It is then incorporated into the steam, which expands and drives the piston. Then the steam is brought in contact with a cold body, or refrigerator, which condenses the steam by cooling it, after which it is again put in contact with the furnace, and the cycle begins all over again. Carnot saw that in every case, work can be produced from heat only if some heat is absorbed from the furnace at a higher temperature and discharged at the refrigerator at a lower temperature. He concluded that just as the fall of water from one height to another is the source of motive power in the water wheel, so too the fall of heat from one temperature to another is the source of power in a steam engine, and hence presumably in any heat engine. Now, it may have occurred to some of you that one could operate a steam engine without any refrigerator at all. That is, after boiling the water and using the pressure of the expanding steam to drive the piston, you simply open the piston, expel the steam into the atmosphere, add new water, and begin the boiling process all over again. In fact, the more primitive steam engines of Carnot's time did operate in just this way, using fresh water for each cycle and eliminating the condensation phase. In that case, what becomes of Carnot's fall of heat? Carnot, however, anticipated this objection and answered it by pointing out that in such instances, the atmosphere itself is cooler than the steam and functions as an enormous refrigerator. That is, when the piston is open, opened, the heated steam goes away only because the surrounding air is cool enough to receive it. Thus, the <coughs> condensation phase cannot really be eliminated. In harnessing the motive power of heat, one cannot escape the necessary flow of heat from a hot body to a cold body. As Carnot put it, the motive power of a steam engine is due to a reestablishment of the equilibrium of caloric. 
That is, just as water spontaneously flows downhill to restore its mechanical equilibrium, so heat spontaneously flows from a hotter body to a colder body to restore its thermal equilibrium. Just as water engines could do no work if all water were at sea level, no work could be done by steam engines if all bodies were at the same temperature. And just as water never spontaneously flows uphill, heat never spontaneously flows from a colder body to a hotter body. Conversely, wherever there exists a difference of temperature, motive power can be produced by allowing the heat to fall from the hot body to the cold body while driving a heat engine. Carnot took the analogy with water power one step further, however. Just as the water driving a water wheel is not destroyed in passing from one elevation to another, Carnot reasoned that heat is not consumed in passing through a heat engine. It is merely transported from a hot body to a cold body. Carnot found it easier to draw this conclusion because he believed in the conservation of heat. That is, he subscribed to the common view championed by Lavoisier in the previous century that heat is a subtle material fluid, usually called caloric, that can be neither created nor destroyed. The very title of Carnot's book on the motive power of fire already indicates his belief in the material nature of heat. The fall of heat that produces motive power in a steam engine is thus the flow of caloric from a hot body to a cold body. And since, since heat or caloric is indestructible, the steam engine does not operate by converting heat into work. In the cyclical operation of the steam engine, the same quantity of heat that is absorbed by the steam at the furnace must also be discharged by the steam at the refrigerator. By the 1850s, it was to become clear that the caloric theory was untenable as an account of the nature of heat, and it began to give way to the rival mechanical theory of heat. According to the mechanical theory, heat is not a subtle material substance. It is a form of motion. Heat is not conserved during the operation of a steam engine. It is consumed in the production of work. Indeed, the quantity of work produced by the consumption of a unit of heat is always the same a universal constant of nature. Thus, the steam engine produces a certain quantity of work only because a definite quantity of heat is consumed during each cycle. Accordingly, on any cycle in which work is done, the quantity of heat discharged at the refrigerator must be smaller than the quantity of heat absorbed at the furnace. That is, of the heat absorbed at the furnace, part is converted into work and part is passed to the refrigerator. Note that the old caloric theory and the new mechanical theory of heat are not in disagreement about the conservation of energy. Carnot himself accepted the principle that energy, the capacity to do work, can be neither created nor destroyed. What Carnot denied is that heat is a form of energy. Instead, he considered it an indestructible substance that is capable of doing work when it undergoes a fall in temperature, just as water is capable of doing work when it undergoes a fall of elevation. Overall, Carnot had three brilliant insights that survive to this day, unsullied by his error regarding the nature of heat. The first insight is the fall of heat, which we've already considered. The second insight is the cycle. Carnot saw that in order to understand the motive power of a steam engine, it is not sufficient to look only at the heat generated in the, in the furnace and the work done by the piston. In order to see the relation between heat and work, one must contrive to return the heated and expanded steam to its original condition. That is, the steam must be cooled and compressed so that it is in exactly the same state it was in before it absorbed heat from the furnace. Only if the cycle is completed in this way can we be confident that the work done by the piston is the only mechanical effect of the heat absorbed at the furnace. If we do not complete the cycle, but leave the steam in its heated and expanded state, we would have to include the alteration of the state of the steam as an effect of the heat absorbed at the furnace. In short, Carnot saw that a complete cycle must be considered if we are to understand fully the necessary and sufficient conditions for heat to do work. Consideration of the complete cycle and the fall of heat led Carnot to his third great insight. He noticed that under certain circumstances, the operations that make up the cycle are reversible. 
What do we mean by a reversible process? Consider again the water wheel. Under normal operation, the wheel produces work by taking in water at the upper level and discharging it at the lower level. But the wheel could be operated in reverse, taking in water at the lower level and discharging it at the upper level. In that case, of course, we would have to supply the work of turning the wheel and raising the water. In effect, a water wheel operating in reverse is a machine for converting mechanical energy into the potential energy of water at a raised elevation in the Earth's gravitational field. Note, however, that no actual water wheel can be entirely reversible. If at any point in the operation of a water wheel, any water is allowed to fall some distance without driving the wheel, that part of the operation is irreversible because turning the wheel in reverse would not restore the water to the height that was lost. In a perfect or completely reversible water wheel, the water must not be permitted to fall any distance without driving the wheel as it falls. Of course, water wheels fall short of perfect reversibility in other ways as well. Any friction in the operation of the machinery, any turbulence in the flow of the water are processes that it would be impossible to reverse if the wheel is operated backwards. Carnot noted that heat engines, too, can be operated in reverse. Under normal operation, a heat engine produces work by taking in heat at the furnace at a higher temperature and discharging heat at the refrigerator at a lower temperature. Operated in reverse, a heat engine would absorb heat at the lower temperature and discharge heat at the higher temperature. In effect, a heat engine operating in reverse is a refrigerating machine, or a heat pump, which extracts heat from a cold body and expels it into a hotter body. Of course, to operate a refrigerating machine, we would have to supply work in order to, dr to drive the heat engine in reverse. In a reverse steam engine, for example, we would have to compress the steam mechanically at the higher temperature so as to expel its heat to the hotter body or furnace. Carnot saw that not every heat engine can be operated fully in reverse. In particular, if at any stage in the operation of a steam engine, some heat is allowed to fall from a higher temperature to a lower temperature without doing expansive work on the steam, that part of the operation will not be reversible. For example, if the vessel containing the heated steam is not well insulated and loses some of its heat by direct conduction to the cooler air that surrounds it, that part of the cycle would be irreversible because by operating the engine backwards, it would not be possible to recover the heat thus lost to the environment. A fully reversible steam engine is one in which no heat is ever allowed to flow directly from a hot body to a cold body, or equivalently, one in which the fall of heat is always mediated by the expansive power, by the expansive work of the steam. Or as Carnot put it, the condition of perfect reversibility and hence maximum efficiency in a heat engine is that there should occur no changes of temperature which are not due to changes of volume. In practice, all actual working heat engines are irreversible to one degree or another. <coughs> Nevertheless, Carnot's theory is founded on consideration of the ideal, perfectly reversible heat engine. If during one cycle, a reversible steam engine absorbs a certain quantity of heat from the furnace and produces a definite amount of expansive work, then by consuming that same amount of work, we can operate the engine in reverse and restore to the furnace the same quantity of heat. That is Carnot's idea of reversibility. Now, armed with these three great insights, namely the fall of heat, the cycle, and the idea of re reversibility, Carnot stated and proved an astonishingly general theorem regarding the operation of any and all heat engines. This theorem permitted him to answer the questions with which his reflections began about the maximum efficiency possible in heat engines. As you will recall, engines, engineers at the time wondered whether there was any assignable limit to the amount of work that could be extracted from a given quantity of heat, and whether, in particular, an expansive agent other than steam might derive work from heat more efficiently. What Carnot proved was, in his own words, that the motive power of heat is independent of the agents employed to realize it. Its quantity is fixed solely by the temperatures of the bodies between which the transport of caloric finally takes place. And therefore, the maximum of motive power resulting from the employment of steam is also the maximum of motive power realizable by any means whatsoever. 
More precisely, what Carnot shows is that any reversible engine operating between two fixed temperatures produces work at the maximum efficiency possible for those temperatures. That is, no choice of a different working substance could possibly improve on the efficiency of a given reversible engine. His pr proof is a remarkably simple reductio ad absurdum. And for this, I would like you to look at page two of the end. Suppose we have a working reversible heat engine that after a certain period of, of operation has absorbed a quantity of heat Q at the furnace while producing a quantity of work W. This is process A in the handout. Operated in reverse, our engine will consume a quantity of work W while discharging to the furnace the quantity of heat Q. That's process B. Now, imagine that there is a second, more efficient engine that absorbs the same quantity of heat Q at the furnace while yielding a quantity of work W plus delta W greater than the work produced by our first engine. This would be process C. Suppose we now combine the forward operation of our second engine with the backwards operation of our first engine. This would be process B plus C. Our second engine absorbs heat Q at the furnace while yielding work W plus delta W, process C. Our first engine, operated in reverse, will restore all the heat Q to the furnace while consuming only work W, process B. The net result of B plus C is that the quantity of work delta W has been produced without taking any heat from the furnace. At this point, Ricardo took a false step guided by his belief that heat is indestructible. Since all the heat absorbed at the furnace has been returned to it by the end of our combined operation, Carnot assumed that the refrigerator has also given back all the heat that it received. The net effect of the combined operation was, in his eyes, the creation of work out of nothing. And that is impossible because it amounts to the operation of a perpetual motion machine. But if we do not assume with Carnot that heat is indestructible and instead acknowledge that some of the heat is converted into work, we will have to conclude that at the end of Carnot's combined operation, the work delta W has been produced not out of nothing, but out of heat extracted from the refrigerator. This would not be a perpetual motion machine in the original sense, but rather a machine that does work merely by extracting heat from the colder body. Had Carnot remained agnostic on the question of the nature of heat, he could still have proved his theorem by basing the reductio on a different ground. Let me explain. And again, now look at the bottom of page two of my hand. Consider again the three processes A, B, and C. Process B, you will recall, is the reverse operation of our engine one, consuming work W while discharging heat Q to the furnace. Suppose the engine in this process is run a little longer so that altogether it consumes work W plus delta W while discharging to the furnace a quantity of heat Q plus delta Q. Let us call this prolonged version of process B process D. If we now combine processes D and C, the net result is that no work has been done while a quantity of heat delta Q has been transmitted to the furnace. Now, both the caloric and the mechanical theory of heat agree in denying that heat can be produced out of nothing when no work has been done. And therefore, on both theories, we are forced to conclude that the heat delta Q given to the furnace has been extracted from the refrigerator. So the net result is that heat has been transferred from a cold body to a hot body without any other permanent change taking place. But that is impossible, according to Carnot. So, our original assumption that engine two is more efficient than reversible engine one must be false, QED. Notice that Carnot's flawed reductio proof relied on the impossibility of producing work out of nothing, that is, on the principle of the conservation of energy, which has come to be known as the first law of thermodynamics. In contrast, our modified version of his proof relies on the statement that heat cannot flow spontaneously 
from a cold body to a hot body. And this latter statement is the form in which Clausius first expressed his entropy principle, which we now call the second law of thermodynamics. It is often said that Carnot, with his insight about the fall of heat and his belief that heat was indestructible, discovered the second law of thermodynamics without knowing the first law. But this is quite misleading. As we can see in his rejection of perpetual motion, Carnot embraced the idea of energy conservation. He merely denied that heat is a form of energy. He believed that heat did work by falling down a temperature gradient, much as water does work by falling down a gradient of height. Carnot ruled out a spontaneous passage of heat from a cold body to a hot body on the same ground that he ruled out the spontaneous ascent of water up a hill. Both would be violations of energy conservation, producing work out of nothing. Ironically then, for Carnot, the impossibility of heat flowing from a colder to a hotter body is not an original and independent law, but rather a routine consequence of the law of energy conservation. Because he misunderstood the nature of heat, he was unable to recognize the significance of what he had in fact found, the second law of thermodynamics. The theorem proved by Carnot has important consequences, both theoretical and practical. Practically, it means that a heat engine operating between two fixed temperatures can be made more efficient only by making its operations more perfectly reversible. Changing the working substance, say, from steam to air or to alcohol will not raise the maximum rate at which, at which work can be derived from heat. Theoretically, Carnot's theorem means that in a perfectly reversible heat engine, the work produced per unit of heat absorbed depends only on the temperatures of the furnace and the refrigerator. Carnot himself never found the formula expressing that dependence, so he could not write down an expression for the efficiency of a reversible heat engine. That was one of the great tasks that he left to his immediate successors, Lord Kelvin and Rudolf Clausius. More importantly, Carnot's work led within a generation to the discovery of entropy and the precise mathematical statement of the second law of thermodynamics. To follow this development of Carnot's ideas, it will help to go a little further into his account of the operation of a reversible heat engine. In a steam engine, the cycle usually involves a phase where the steam is cooled and compressed sufficiently to condense it into water. But that is not a necessary feature of the operation of heat engines. For simplicity's sake, we will assume a heat engine whose working substance is always in a gaseous state and is never liquefied. At any given moment, the gas occupies a certain volume and is assumed to have a definite uniform temperature and pressure. At this point, all we need to know about its behavior is that like any gas, its temperature tends to fall spontaneously when it expands and to rise spontaneously when it is compressed. And if the volume is held constant, the pressure will rise as the temperature rises and fall as the temperature falls. Let us suppose a reversible heat engine operating between two fixed temperatures. That is, we assume that the furnace and refrigerator are always maintained at constant temperatures so that the vessel containing gas always absorbs heat at a fixed higher temperature and discharges it at a fixed lower temperature. That will be the case if the furnace and refrigerator are assumed to be so large compared to the vessel of gas that their temperatures are practically unaffected by the operation of our engine. Following Carnot, we shall call the furnace body A and its temperature TA, and the refrigerator is body B and its temperature TB. The cycle that Carnot describes has four phases, and here I refer you to page three of the handout. At the start of the cycle, <coughs> the vessel of gas is assumed to be at the higher temperature, Ta. It is put in contact with the furnace, body A, and allowed to expand while maintaining the same temperature, Ta. Since its natural tendency is to fall in temperature, it must absorb heat from body A in order to maintain a constant temperature during this expansion. Since the gas is expanding, it does useful work in driving the piston. Because its expansion all takes place at constant temperature, we shall call this phase the phase of isothermal expansion. We now remove the gas from contact with body A, 
but allow it to continue expanding and thus to continue doing work by driving the piston. The temperature of the gas will fall spontaneously during this further expansion, but the gas neither gains nor loses any heat from its surroundings. A process during which no heat passes into or out of a body is called an adiabatic process. From the ancient Greek word adiabatos, which means not to be passed. Incidentally, this word makes its first appearance in Xenophon's Anabasis, where it describes certain wild and impassable Babylonian rivers. Be that as it may, we shall call this second phase of the cycle the phase of adiabatic expansion, during which no heat is either absorbed or expelled. This phase ends when the gas has expanded and cooled to the point where it has fallen to the temperature Tb of body B, the refrigerator. At this point, it is safe to bring the gas into contact with body B. Since they now are, are at the same temperature, no heat will be passing from a hot body directly to a cold body. In Carnot's terms, there will be no useless restoration of the equilibrium of caloric, and the process will remain reversible. During the third phase, we compress the gas while maintaining it at temperature Tb. Since its temperature tends to rise spontaneously during this compression, it must discharge heat to body B in order to maintain its low temperature. To compress the gas during this phase, work must be done on the engine. This third phase is called the phase of isothermal compression. And finally, for the fourth phase, we remove the gas from contact with body B, continue compressing it without passage of heat to or from the gas. The gas spontaneously rises in temperature during this phase of adiabatic compression. The compression during which work must be done on the engine continues until the gas has risen to TA, the temperature of the furnace. At that point, it is once again safe to bring it into contact with the furnace, body A, and to begin another period of isothermal expansion. Whatever state of volume and pressure the gas is in when it reaches temperature TA at the end of the adiabatic compression will therefore be considered the starting point of every subsequent cycle. Henceforth, at the end of each cycle, the gas has been restored to exactly the same temperature, pressure, and volume that it had at the beginning of the cycle. We can therefore be sure that the only effect of the cycle is to do expansive work while taking in heat at the higher temperature and discharging heat at the lower temperature. Now, you may have been disturbed to learn that the engine does work only during the two expansive phases while well, work must be done on the engine during the two phases of comp compression. Only if the expansive work exceeds the compressive work will the cycle as a whole produce usable work. Fortunately, that is the case because the changes of volume during expansion all occur at higher temperatures and therefore at higher pressures than the, than the corresponding changes of volume during compression. Accordingly, in a reversible heat engine, the expansive work done by the engine always exceeds the compressive work done on the engine. So the net effect is that the engine does a certain quantity of external work for each cycle of its operation. For brevity's sake, we shall call the two phases of isothermal compression and expansion isotherms, and we shall call the two phases of adiabatic expansion and compression adiabats. The cycle we have just described in which a reversible heat engine executes two isotherms alternating with two adiabats is what has come to be known as a Carnot cycle. Carnot cycles are very easy to visualize with the aid of a kind of diagram introduced by the French engineer Emile Clapeyron in 1834. We shall use Clapeyron's diagrams in a slightly modified form. This is the diagram at the bottom of page three. In Cartesian coordinates, we plot temperature on the vertical axis and volume on the horizontal axis. A point in the quadrant then represents a particular momentary state of the gas undergoing a Carnot cycle. And a closed curve in the quadrant represents a cyclical process, that is, one which returns the gas to its original state. Isothermal processes are represented in the diagram by horizontal lines, since they occur at constant temperature. Moving from left to right on a horizontal means increasing volume, that is expanding at constant temperature. In our diagram, the engine cycles clockwise from point one to two to three to four and back to one again. Between points one and two, the gas undergoes isothermal expansion while in contact with the furnace. Between two and three, it expands adiabatically while cooling down to temperature Tb. From three to four, it is compressed 
isothermally while in contact with the refrigerator, and from four back to one, the gas undergoes adiabatic compression until it again reaches the temperature of the furnace. Note that the gas gains heat on the isotherm, isotherm from one to two, loses heat on the isotherm from three to four, and neither gains nor loses heat on the adiabats from two to three and from four to one. Finally, work is done by the engine during the expansive part of the cycle from one to three, and work must be done on the engine during the compressive part of the cycle from three back to one. Since the Carnot cycle is perfectly reversible, let us see what happens when it is run backwards, cycling through the points of our diagram in reverse order, that is counterclockwise. Suppose the reversal takes place at point two, the end of the isothermal expansion phase. We keep the gas in contact with the furnace body A, but now we compress it isothermally while discharging heat to body A at temperature TA. When it reaches point one of the diagram, we remove it from the body A and allow it to expand adiabatically until its temperature falls to TB, point four in the diagram. Then we put it in contact with body B and allow it to continually expand, to continue expanding isothermally while absorbing heat from body B. And finally at point three, we remove it from body B and compress it adiabatically until its temperature rises to TA, point two. By operating the heat engine backwards for one cycle, we entirely neutralize the effects of the original cycle. Whatever work was done by the engine in the original cycle must be consumed by the engine in the backwards cycle. Whatever heat was absorbed from the furnace is now discharged to the furnace, and whatever heat was discharged to the refrigerator is now absorbed from the refrigerator. Operating in reverse, the work of compression exceeds the work of expansion since the compression takes place at higher temperatures. The backwards operation of the heat engine is a process of refrigeration in that we are doing work on the machine with the result that heat is extracted from a cold body and given to a hot body. For the rest of the 19th century, despite his embrace of the ill-starred caloric theory, Carnot's idea of the perfect heat engine as a reversible cycle as a reversible cyclic process operating between two temperatures became the indispensable vehicle for all serious progress in thermodynamics. It captured the imagination of all the great scientists who came across Carnot's work, and it led more or less directly to the completion of classical thermodynamics in the 1850s and 60s. To bring our discussion of the Carnot cycle to a close, we must mention once more the awkward fact that Carnot's brilliant achievements in thermodynamics were tangled up with an erroneous theory of heat, the caloric theory, according to which heat can neither be destroyed nor created. Carnot believed incorrectly that all the heat absorbed at the furnace must also be discharged at the refrigerator. We now know, however, that some of that heat is converted into work so that the heat discharged to the refrigerator must be less than the heat absorbed at the furnace. How it is that Carnot's adherence to the caloric theory did not undermine the validity of his main results is a fascinating story well beyond the scope of our present discussion. In the meantime, as we move forward in our history, let us remind ourselves of Carnot's three key insights which he bequeathed to the next generation, the fall of heat, the cycle, and the idea of irreversibility. For a generation after it appeared in 1824, Carnot's book was almost entirely neglected. It was then rediscovered by Kelvin and Clausius around 1850. In the meantime, the investigations of James Joule have undermined the authority of the caloric theory of heat. Kelvin himself, however, still believed in the conservation of heat when he embraced Carnot's ideas in 1848, and it seemed to him highly doubtful that Carnot's treatment of the heat engine could survive if one abandoned the axiom that heat is indestructible. It was Clausius in 1850 who first saw clearly that Carnot's main ideas could be salvaged even if the caloric theory of heat was discarded in favor of the mechanical theory. Clausius showed how one could give up Carnot's assumption that no heat is lost in the operation of the Carnot cycle while modifying Carnot's reductio proof of the theorem that a reversible heat engine attains the maximum possible efficiency. Carnot's proof then remains essentially valid with the correction that we have already discussed. What Clausius attempted was to combine the mechanical theory of heat with what he regarded as the, as the sound part of Carnot's insight regarding the fall of heat. 
That is, he tried to ground the science of thermodynamics in two fundamental principles or laws. According to the first principle, energy is conserved, while heat and work, being forms of energy, are uniformly interconvertible. Clausius had a harder time formulating the second principle with precision. One of his early formulations is that heat cannot of itself pass from a colder body to a warmer body. Another formulation is that heat has a spontaneous tendency to pass from a warmer body to a colder body. Clausius' great achievement in the 1850s was to translate this principle into a precise mathematical statement. According to Clausius, Carnot regarded the production of work as the equivalent of a mere transport of heat from a hot body to a cold one, the quantity of heat being thereby undiminished. Clausius wants to discard that last clause while retaining the rest of the principle. He writes, although we have no need of a peculiar equivalent for the produced work, after we have assumed as such an actual consumption of heat, it is nevertheless possible that the said transport of heat may take place contemporaneously with the consumption and may likewise stand in a certain definite relation to the produced work. In other words, both the consumption of heat and the transport of heat from a hot to a cold body may be necessary conditions for the production of work, but it is not yet clear what definite relation the transport of heat has to, to the production of work. Clausius was to solve this problem in his next great contribution to thermodynamics, the paper of 1854. In that paper, Clausius presents a modified form of the Carnot cycle designed to separate out the two conditions for the production of work, namely the, consum the consumption of heat and the fall or transport of heat from a hot body to a cold one. Clausius's complex Carnot cycle operates at three different temperatures instead of two. In effect, he has two furnaces and one refrigerator. And here I refer you to page four. Referring to the diagram, the cycle begins at point one, where the gas in contact with furnace A begins isothermal expansion at temperature Ta. At point two, it is removed from furnace A and allowed to expand and cool adiabatically to temperature Tb, which it reaches at point three. From three to four, it expands isothermally while in contact with furnace B at temperature Tb. Between four and five, it expands adiabatically and cools down to temperature Tc. From five to six, it is compressed isothermally while in contact with refrigerator C. And then from six to one, it is compressed adiabatically until it has warmed up to temperature Ta. In effect, the gas absorbs heat successively from two furnaces at two different temperatures, after which it discharges heat to the refrigerator at a third temperature. Let us remind ourselves that in Carnot's original presentation of the simple four-point cycle, he believed that no heat was consumed, so that the heat absorbed from the furnace was equal to the heat discharged to the refrigerator. But Clausius's principle of the interconvertibility of heat and work requires that the heat gained during isothermal expansion at the furnace exceed the heat lost during isothermal compression at the refrigerator. The excess is the net heat converted into work during one cycle. In our diagram of the simple Carnot cycle, that means that more heat is absorbed between points one and two than is discharged between points three and four. Similarly, in Clausius's complex six-point cycle, the heat absorbed from the two furnaces exceeds the heat lost to the one refrigerator. Clausius is therefore free to adjust the durations of the two isothermal expansion phases, phases one to, two, one to two and three to four, so that the heat absorbed between points three and four exactly equals the heat lost between points five and six. Let us call each of these quantities of heat Q. Since the heat gained between three and four is canceled out by the heat lost between five and six, and since no heat is gained or lost, on the adiabats 2 to 3, 4 to 5, and 6 to 1, we conclude that from point 2 clockwise all the way around to point 1, no heat is gained or lost. Therefore, the only heat gained in the whole cycle must be gained between points 1 and 2, that is, during the first isothermal expansion. But since at the end of the cycle the gas has returned to its original state and has neither gained nor lost any heat, 
the heat gained between 1 and 2 must have been entirely converted into work. Let us call this quantity of heat Q1. In this way, Clausius has constructed a cycle in which a certain quantity of heat Q1 has been entirely converted into work at the high temperature Ta, while another quantity of heat Q has been allowed to fall from the intermediate temperature Tb to the lower temperature Tc. He has thus broken down the Carnot cycle into two different kinds of transformation, the first kind being a conversion of heat into work, the second kind being a fall of heat in the original, Carnot, the original Carnotian sense. What is the relation between these two different transformations? Clausius' surprising answer is that they are equivalent to one another. But how is it possible for a conversion of heat into work to be equivalent to a fall of heat from one temperature to another? Referring again to the diagram of the complex cycle, we note that the conversion of heat Q1 into work on the first isotherm is a way of passing from point 1 to point 2 on the cycle. To get from point 2 back to point 1, one could simply follow the first isotherm backwards, that is, as a compression. But one could also continue clockwise from point 2 all the way around the cycle to point 1, allowing heat Q to fall from Tb to Tc. In effect, either of the two transformations, when reversed, can take the place of the other transformation in the cycle. It is for that reason that Clausius calls the two transformations equivalent. Clausius now takes a very bold mathematical leap. He conjectures that it should be possible to assign a mathematical magnitude to each transformation in such a way that equivalent transformations have, equivalent, have equal magnitudes. He calls the magnitude of a given transformation its equivalence value. He then sets out to find the law that will assign appropriate equivalence values to all transformations. Through an ingenious argument whose steps we unfortunately cannot follow here, Clausius concludes that the equivalent value of an isothermal conversion of work into heat is equal to Q divided by T, where Q is the heat and T is the temperature. The, ver the reverse operation, the conversion of heat into work, has the equivalence value minus Q of T. As for a fall of heat from temperature T1 to temperature T2, Clausius argues that the equivalence value assigned to it should be Q times the quantity 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. You can see this on page 4 of the handout. By comparing the two expressions, Clausius shows that the second kind of transformation, the fall of heat, is also equivalent to a double transformation of the first kind, that is, a conversion of heat into work at the higher temperature and back from work into heat at the lower temperature. Indeed, Carnot draws the general conclusion that every, every transport of heat from one body to another is equivalent to a conversion of heat into work and back again into heat. On this basis, Clausius shows how to assign a total net value to all the transformations of both kinds in any cyclical process, however complicated. One merely looks at each quantity of heat lost or gained by any body at any temperature and sums up the values of Q over T or minus Q over T for all of these processes. In the case of Clausius's six-point Carnot cycle, the fall of heat has the same equivalence value, though with opposite sign, as the conversion of heat into work. Therefore, traveling all the way around the cycle, the sum of the equivalence values will be zero. Clausius shows in general that every reversible cyclical process must have a net equivalence value of zero. In the six-point cycle, for example, the fall of heat has a positive equivalence value, which is exactly compensated by the negative equivalence value of the conversion of heat into work. In a simple four-point Carnot cycle, where the conversion of heat is not kept separate from the fall of heat, it is clear that the equivalence values of the two isotherms must be equal and opposite. In other words, the value Q over T for the heat absorbed at the higher temperature must equal the value Q over T for the heat expelled at the lower temperature. Since the difference between the heat absorbed and the heat expelled is the heat converted into work on one cycle, Clausius was immediately able to write down the formula for the efficiency of a Carnot cycle operating between any two temperatures, a feat that had eluded Carnot. It took him another 11 years to see it, 
But what Clausius had discovered here in his 1854 paper was a new fundamental quantity in nature, the entropy. The quantity of heat contained by a body can change either by direct conduction of heat to or from another body or, or by conversion of its heat into work. In either case, a change in the heat content of a body is always accompanied by a change of entropy. Whenever heat enters a body at a given temperature, the body's entropy is increased by an amount equal to Q divided by T. Whenever heat leaves a body, its entropy decreases by Q divided by T. Now consider Clausius's two kinds of transformations. When heat is converted into work, the entropy decreases, whereas when heat falls from a hot body to a cold body, the net entropy in both bodies increases. When these two operations are combined in a Carnot cycle, the total change in entropy for all bodies is zero, since the production of work is exactly compensated by the fall of heat and the fall of heat by the production of work. Recall that in a reversible cycle, heat is never allowed to fall from a hot body to a cold body without doing work by means of the heat engine. In Clausius's new way of speaking, there must be no uncompensated falls of heat if a cycle is to be perfectly reversible. In particular, heat can never be converted into work without a compensating fall of heat from a hot to a cold body. And heat can never flow from a cold to a hot body without a compensating consumption of work. One recognizes in these statements Clausius's early qualitative expressions of the second law of thermodynamics. What about an irreversible cycle? We know that it is always possible for heat to flow directly from a hot body to a cold body without the intervention of a heat engine. In that case, the increase of entropy due to the fall of heat is not compensated by the decrease of entropy due to the production of work. Therefore, in, reverse, in, sorry, in irreversible cycles, the net entropy must always increase. But since in the real world no machine ever operates with perfect reversibility, and there are always some uncompensated flows of heat from, cold, from hot to cold bodies, one may conclude that in every actual cyclic process, the entropy changes must always be greater than or equal to zero, with perfectly reversible processes forming the lower limit. And that is Clausius's mature quantitative statement of the second law of thermodynamics. Looking backwards, one may see that Clausius's achievement is, in a real sense, a vindication of Carnot's insights regarding what goes on in heat engines. Carnot thought of heat at a higher temperature as somehow more energetic, more capable of doing work than heat at a lower temperature. Accordingly, to allow heat to pass directly from a hot body to a cold one is simply a waste of available energy, uncompensated by useful work, since the measure of entropy change is heat lost or gained divided by temperature We can now see that high temperature heat is low entropy heat, and vice versa. The uncompensated flow of heat from hot to cold bodies is thus a spontaneous increase of entropy and a permanent loss of some portion of the usable energy in the universe. Not only did Carnot see that a fall of heat is necessary in order for heat to do work, he also believed that something absorbed from the furnace is passed undiminished to the refrigerator. He thought it was the heat. And he was wrong. But it does turn out that in a reversible engine, exactly the same amount of entropy that enters the engine at the furnace also leaves the engine at the refrigerator. Final section on implications of the discovery of entropy. I have already reported the gloomy expectations that the second law of thermodynamics has inspired in some authors. In contrast to classical Newtonian mechanics, thermodynamics teaches that for any closed system and for the universe as a whole, the future is essentially different from the past and probably not for the better. Whether such thinking justifies a general mood of despondency or rather a resolute determination to eat, drink, and be merry is perhaps a question we might, might discuss. But to bring this talk to a timely end, I would like to briefly mention two other implications of the discovery of entropy that seem worth pondering. First, there is the perennial question of how much our understanding of the human things and of our place in the whole can be, can be affected by the discoveries of modern science. 
In this case, that question takes an especially interesting turn. I think there is little doubt that the existence and nature of entropy could not have been discovered apart from the modern scientific project. And it is well known that that project and its origin is closely associated with the goal of the mastery of nature for the enlargement of human power. But in this case, we find the peculiar circumstance that a major theoretical advance was achieved, and I would argue could only have been achieved by intense reflection on a nitty-gritty problem of engineering, specifically how to improve the efficiency of a steam engine. Indeed, the science of thermodynamics was discovered not so much through contemplation of nature, but through study of machinery. The Carnot cycle is, after all, an idealization of the operation of a man-made engine, not of anything that is ever encountered in nature. The discovery of entropy, then, seems to be a case where not only modern science, but even modern technology as such, gr grimy, sooty, and oil-soaked, has produced key theoretical insights into the nature of our world and our place in it. This seems to me a point worth discussing. Second, there is a subtle and interesting question concerning the theoretical status of the two laws of thermodynamics themselves. When we label something a law of nature, does that grandiose phrase mean anything more than a generalization from experience? Interestingly, Albert Einstein, who is typically skeptical of any physical theory's claim to absolute truth, wrote of the deep impression made upon him by classical thermodynamics, quote, it is the only physical theory of universal content concerning which I am convinced that within the framework of the applicability of its basic concepts, it will never be overthrown. As I mentioned earlier, the conservation of energy, the subject of the first law, seems to most people a more clear and intuitive idea than the increase of entropy, the subject of the second law. The former would appear to rest on the axiom or intuition that a perpetual motion machine is impossible. That is, that work cannot be done without the expenditure of energy. This is but a more precise expression of the age-old conviction that there can be no science of nature. In fact, there can be no nature at all unless nothing can come from nothing. That is a conviction that was shared by all the Greek philosophers, from the atomists to the idealists, and perhaps by every scientist since. But what is its basis? The scientific champions of the first law were inclined to invoke theological considerations. Joule, for example, declared that, quote, the grand agents of nature are, by the creator's fiat, indestructible. And wherever a mechanical force is expended, an exact equivalent of heat is always obtained. And Kelvin tells us that he is certain that, quote, creative power alone can either call into existence or annihilate mechanical energy. Creative power for the capital C and P. Meanwhile, in the book of Exodus, when God wanted to attract the attention of Moses, he set in his path a bush that burned with fire but was not consumed. Only when Moses turned aside to see for himself why the bush burned but did not burn up, did God reveal his plan for the liberation of the children of Israel from slavery. Evidently, the qualities that God was looking for in the leader of the Jewish people were scientific curiosity plus an intuitive grasp of the first law of thermodynamics. <laughs> and yet, an intuition is not a proof, and the ultimate ground for our belief in the conservation of energy remains an enigma. Perhaps the only significant advance on this question was made in 1915 by Emmy Noether, the greatest woman mathematician in history. What she proved was that every conservation law is the consequence of a particular symmetry that is found in nature. The conservation of energy in particular is associated with symmetry or invariance of a certain dynamical function called the Lagrangian with respect to translation in time. Of course, Noether's theorem only shifts the question of the ground of energy conservation to the equally perplexing question, why are there such symmetries in nature? As for the second law of thermodynamics, it appears to rest on the intuition or axiom that heat cannot spontaneously flow from a cold body to a hot body. That is, that it can be made to flow in, the direction, in that direction only if work is done on the system. I leave it to you to judge whether this rule is anything more than a generalization from experience. However, 
Only a few years after Clausius coined the term entropy in 1865, the Austrian physicist Ludwig von Boltzmann began a program of research on the random molecular motions that underlie the large-scale phenomena studied by thermodynamics. What Boltzmann created was the science of statistical mechanics, one of whose principal results is a new and deeper understanding of the entropy law. According to Boltzmann, every macroscopic state of a body, for example, a volume of gas at a given temperature, has available to it a multitude of possible microstates. In our example, the innumerable ways that mechanical energy can be distributed among the molecules of a gas in that state. Boltzmann showed that the entropy of a system is a function of the number of microstates available to a given macrostate. And as all microstates are presumed to be equally probable, the Boltzmann entropy turns out to be a function of the relative probability of a given macrostate. Translated into statistical, statistical mechanics, the second law of thermodynamics expresses the fact that over time, systems composed of many particles in random motion tend to evolve from less probable states to more probable states, and not vice versa. Sometimes, the second law is informally said to involve a tendency toward greater disorder, but that is only because ordered states are, for the most part, highly improbable states. Heat tends to flow from a hot body to a cold body simply because a collection of bodies in random motion, yet with all the hotter or faster moving particles in one place and all the colder ones in another place, is highly unlikely to arise by chance, whereas a more or less uniform mixture of faster and slower molecules is much more likely. In the same way, a box of coins all facing heads up is likely when shaken to become a box with about half the coins facing up. Further shaking is unlikely to, to reproduce the original improbable configuration with all coins heads up. If you find this intelligible, you have grasped the essence of the second law of thermodynamics as reinterpreted by Boltzmann. Hence my suggestion that contrary to initial appearances, it is the first law of thermodynamics, the conservation of energy, that is ultimately mysterious as to its ground, whereas the second law, the increase of entropy, at least as clarified by Boltzmann, is the epitome of logic and common sense. Thank you. The floor is open for questions and conversation. so far as to suggest that the unique property of time, that it has a direction, can be explained by thermodynamics, that the, that the increase of entropy is the reason that we have a distinction between past and future. And I've read quite a few efforts to make that argument, and I just don't find that convincing. I wonder whether you have an opinion on it. In other words, it certainly seems true that there are parts of physics, like Newton's mechanics, which strangely don't distinguish between the past and the future. You could reverse time in Newton's laws, and everything would work according, according to them just perfectly, the same way as kind of reversing a movie. But uh, that's not true in thermodynamics. You know, it just doesn't happen that. Uh, a more improbable state spontaneously arises out of a more probable state, of, as we discussed. So it's certainly closely associated with the dis difference between the past and the future, but I can't, I, I'm not convinced that it's the source of that. Do you want to say more about it? Well, the, the notion of the reversibility of classical mechanics, which 
would tell you that there is an interaction to time, just as you said. But there's also the concept of ergodicity mixing flow systems, in which case, um, regardless of the fact that you may start at a very highly ordered state, uh, and, and if you were to propagate that forward in time, it goes to a disordered state. Then if you try to reverse that, you don't go back to the ordered state again. That's observed you know, experimentally. Um, but it, it disobeys, in some sense, then the, the, the Newtonian mechanics, which would have to say something about the uncertainty principle. So there's a, a connection there with the directionality of time, in that sense. But beyond that, I'm not sure what the real deeper connection is. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing I would add is that, of course, as its name implies, statistical mechanics contains truths that are only applicable to large numbers of independent systems. They, it really says nothing about the behavior, behavior of an individual atom. There's no reason why um, the trajectory of an individual atom that we observe couldn't be uh, observed in reverse. And so it, that's one of the main reasons why it seems to me that thermodynamic considerations and specifically statistical mechanical ones, like of the probability view of entropy, can't really explain why we experience time as having a flow from past to future. But you know, it's a why that is is a mystery well worth pondering. I certainly don't have the final word. Please. Uh, what happens when you uh, if we think about uh, the probabilistic theory, stochastic theory of the uh, entropy. Now, when a system is going to the equilibrium, we can think that it is a unique, unique state. And the possibility of that unique state is really, really low. And we can think that entropy is really increasing. Now think about the neutral equilibrium. That means it's not unique. We can have lots of possibilities, like infinite possibilities of the equilibrium. So in that case, do you think entropy will increase worse the equilibrium? Well, just to clarify, that most that the state of equilibrium is a unique macro state, but it has a maximum number of microstates associated with it, right? In other words, for example, if you said if you had a hundred coins in a box, there's only one possible way for all of them to be um, facing heads up. But there are many, many ways for half of them to be facing heads up and half of them to be facing tails up, right? So that's to that, that equilibrium state that a box of coins tends toward, it's a unique state, 50-50. But that's the macro, the macro description, and the micro descriptions are, are numerous. Does that affect what you're asking? Yeah, man, what happens, like, See, means entropy is increasing means probability is decreasing, right? Means it has a less probable state. That is. Uh, now, point is, if you think about like unique solution or unique state for a particular equilibrium, then I can think about that. Okay, the entropy is increasing, but uh, in other states, compared to other states, going towards the less probable. Uh, uh, scale. Now, if I think about it, ju just if you think about in a flat seat or flat uh, some flat surface on the flat surface, a ball is sitting on the flat surface. That means it has infinite possibility of the equilibrium state. Right. right. So, in that case, what I'm thinking, I, that means probability is not really uh, very very low in that case. Just I'm trying to uh, connect probability of the state and the entropy. So in that case, really, it's like uh, entropy is increasing as the system is going towards the equilibrium. Yes, I mean, again, I, I suppose one aspect of what you're talking about is that the that the uh, probability is to some extent relative. That is, you might say, uh, the exact state that something reaches by a random process is highly improbable. It's unique. But um, because it's uh, observationally indistinguishable from a multitude of other states, we say the entropy has increased and it's an improbable state. But that's because we're giving up knowledge of the details. And so you might say that uh, 
statistical mechanics in general requires us to give up detailed, say, Newtonian description of the positions and momenta of all the particles. I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not entirely addressing your point. Sounds interesting. Please. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you, with regard to the statistical understanding of entropy, Shannon used that to great effect in being able to derive limits on how reliably we can communicate and how efficiently we can encode information. Uh, and, and he he gained a lot of his insight. He defined the uh, and the probabilistic entropy and things like this that allowed him to develop a mathematical theory and other people have taken that a long way. So he, he got a lot of insight from thermodynamic entropy and those concepts. Is, do you know, are you aware of any kind of insight from the way Shannon's work is developed with regard to information that has flowed back the other way and caused people in, more in the physics area to get new insights about these things, or about the uh, second law or anything like that? And that's a good question, which I'm not really confident to answer, but that develop that's a fascinating development from the Boltzmann view of entropy as involving probabilities to the Shannon view of en entropy involving loss of information. And uh, it's, it's a remarkably interesting development, which I I imagine has all kinds of consequences for information theory and computing. I don't know much about those fields. Maybe there's someone here who does. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> So the second uh, principle, second law of thermodynamics is very well justified if we think about st st statistical mechanics. From uh, that perspective, it's justifiable that entropy is increasing uh, since the less organized states are more likely. But still, fundamentally, that's not a very convincing proof uh, why, where that originates from, since the nature of random uh, processes and uh, probabilistics uh, is actually something that I don't know if anybody can explain. So where comes randomness? What's the origin, origins of random processes? Can anybody say more than it's something like throwing a coin? So what's in the nature of the universe so fundamental that things seem to So you're asking what the kind of deep question of whether, how we know what role chance plays as opposed to ordered necessity of some kind. And I guess it's true that it's, it's an empirical matter to discover what kind of world we live in. And there's no requirement that we would find that we live in a world in which chance plays much of a role at all. So it's kind of an assumption, perhaps justified by our experience, that that under certain circumstances chance plays a huge role. I mean one of those one of those one question that you could pursue would be the relationship between atomism and uh, the doctrine of chance. That is to discover that the beings that we're familiar with, like human beings or macroscopic objects, are actually composed of countless trillions upon trillions of things moving more or less independ independently of each other immediately gives rise to uh, this, uh, the necessary conditions for a second law to take effect. But I admit it's, it's mysterious where and ultimately unsatisfying to say that you just have to consult experience. One more question? Yes. 
return uh, to the previous what one. What do you think in terms of societal structure? Means if, if, if I think like uh, every society is going, going towards, means it, it, it's now like controlled by some of the like driving parameters, right? So in that case, what do you think? In top increasing or you know, is it Well, it, it, it's probably worth reminding ourselves that the increase of entropy is true of the universe of a whole, as a whole. It's true of any closed system where no energy is flowing in or out. But it's not in any way necessarily true of an open system, a system which is being pumped full of energy. And uh, at least for the time being, we live in such a system. That is, uh, as long as energy is flowing in, uh, there's no reason why such a system couldn't experience for a time and possibly for a very long time, uh, a spontaneous increase in order rather than a decrease. And so uh, you, know, you can comfort yourself in that sense that the heat death of the universe is far off and there may be many billions of years during which we're, we, are, we are not uh, becoming more and more disordered. And that could be true of our society as well. And on that optimistic note, <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you.